My name is Pat Love. I'm the manager of Calaveras Mini Storage in San Andreas, and I am a survivor. Just one year, but it was only skin cancer. Fact, your skin is the largest cell in your body. Skin cancer is the most common form of cancer in the United States. Fact, approximately 800,000 people are living with a history of melanoma. 13 million with non-melanoma. Basal cell being the most common, squamous cell, which is what I had, being the second most common, and of course, melanoma is the most common. About 90% of non-melanoma skin cancers are associated with the UV rays from the sun. Fact, 2.8 million people are diagnosed each year with melanoma. Melanoma is the fifth most common cancer for men and the sixth most common cancer for women. One person dies with melanoma every hour of every day. Fact, women aged 39 and under have a higher probability of developing melanoma than any other cancer except breast cancer. So when someone says to you, oh, it was only skin cancer, we all know that it's very important to find a cure for all the cancers, including only skin cancer. Last year I went to the doctor because I had a small, and I mean very small, little tiny white head in the middle of my forehead. And I asked my doctor, what do you think this is? And he said, and I quote, oh, it's nothing. So he froze it. Within six months, I was back at the doctor, and I asked him again, what is this? It's not going away. And he said, well, we probably should go ahead and get a biopsy of it to see what it actually is. So we went for the biopsy, and, and within two days, I got the call that none of us want to get from our doctor that says, you have cancer. From that point, it was two weeks, and I was in surgery. They did a the new procedure called Mohs surgery, where they take a bit of skin, they test it, and then they bring you back in if you don't have clean perimeters, which I didn't. And it was an all-day process that took, took me to get to the point of having clean perimeters. And then they bandaged me up without ever seeing it and sent me home. This is where we want to thank all of our friends and our family for being there for us when we go through this because it's, those of you that have been through this, it's a very grueling process. And I want to thank my friend Diana for being with me on that day. When I came home and they tell you to clean it the next day, imagine my surprise when we took the bandages off and I had a three by three hole in the middle of my forehead. I wasn't expecting that. So you have to try to make a positive out of that negative. So what I did was I took my pictures, I blew them up to poster size, and I took them to the beauty schools, the one in Sonora and the one in San Andreas, to try to get the girls to understand how important it is at this age to use sunscreen today and every screen. We are adults, we can make that choice. Either use sunscreen or not use sunscreen, but our children don't have that opportunity. They do what we tell them to do. So please, put the sunscreen on your kids today. Make them wear it every day. They've even got UV ray t-shirts, and my grandkids wear them now because they're trying to get the most protection they can possibly get. So make sure that you use it today. And we've got sunscreen we're going to be handing out today in our booth over at Bobby's Brigade. I've got pictures of my surgery that I want to share with everybody. Come by, get your sunscreen, and say hi. And remember, early detection is the key to all of our healing and all of our recovery. So go to your doctor. It doesn't matter if it's a small spot. Mine was a small spot. It turned out to be a three by three spot.
what shows on the outside doesn't tell you what's on the inside, so make sure you have it checked. So, come by today, get your sunscreen, say hi, and remember to get checked. Thank you. Calaveras Relay was the most inspiring relay, the absolutely most inspiring relay that I have been to. And I'm so glad to be here again. I shared the stage last year with a most remarkable young lady, Catherine Cornish, who, as many of you know, uh, fought a remarkable fight with her cancer. And the one thing I learned from Catherine is it doesn't matter if you have cancer or if you don't have cancer or if you have problems or if you don't think you have problems, that you still have the right to live every day as if it were the most important day of your life. And I followed her story in Caring Bridge, and when Jeremy posted uh, her passing in February, I cried with the rest of you. My wife and I came up to her services last month with many of you at Angel's Camp. And it is just my privilege to be here again with you today. Last year, at one of your booths, I purchased two bracelets. This is the second one. The first one I gave to Catherine, just as a momentum of my uh, inspiration that I received from, from her. So I'll cherish this one always. It's the twin of the one she's got. And I think that the one thing I could take away from that experience last year is every day is an important day. We have a beautiful day today. We've got, I was going to say grass, we've got astroturf. <laughs> We've got trees, <laughs> we've just got sky, we've got birds. This is the most remarkable creation of our Lord and Savior, is it not? The legacy of cancer is one not to be missed. I've talked to survivors, I have good friends who are survivors who say, you know, that was one of the best things that ever happened to me, I have missed out on so much before I realized how much I was missing out on. I lost my dad in 1980 to prostate cancer at the young age of 57. He was the youngest of nine children, grew up on a farm in Wisconsin. He was the first one of his brothers and sisters to die. He was always my hero. Growing up, he coached my little league team. You know, he worked in some important jobs. He worked at Aerojet, worked on the rockets to send first men to the moon. He had some important jobs, but you would never know that from being at home with him and just having that wonderful relationship of a wonderful, loving father. He was a World War II hero. He went on to work at Aerojet Nuclear in Idaho Falls and worked on loss of fluid testing, which is what the Japanese tsunamis were causing a couple of years ago. And you know, I took the last uh, three months of 1979 as a leave of absence from work so I could spend time with him and my mom. I knew he was undergoing some really debilitating treatments for his prostate cancer. You know, the things we take for granted today, PSA testing didn't exist back then. Modern surgeries didn't exist back then. Hormone ablation therapies didn't exist back then. So he was undergoing some pretty experimental and, in hindsight, barbaric treatments. And I took the last three months of 1979 off to be with him and my mom. Some of the best time of my life, you know. And we reminisced about times gone by. And I remember asking him, you know, when, when I played Little League, I wasn't very good. He said, well, I, I know. I said, but, but you had me play in second base. You know, usually the people that are not that good are playing like right field. And he looked at me and he said, you couldn't throw the ball far enough to get it in from right field. <laughs> Honesty, we had a great time. He wanted to go shopping for presents for each of my brothers and sisters. There are five of us. I went with him to the store when he didn't feel like it. We bought my brother an electric train set. We just did all that. Well, in February of 1980, uh, I got the last call from him. I said, we're going to fight this thing. He said, I don't think it's, it's going to happen this time. And he passed in early February 1980. 
And that's important to me because he was a scientist and he did everything he could to find out about his disease, what the treatments were for that disease. He came to Stanford, one of three linear accelerator radiation treatment facilities in the country to fight that disease. So when I got a diagnosis of the same disease in the fall of 1993, I said, I need to do the same thing. I need to find out what's out here now. I need to find out what treatments are available. I need to do the very best I can to partner with the very best medical experts there are to fight this disease. And by then we had PSA testing. We also had modern surgeries. I researched cryotherapy. I researched radiation therapy. I researched three beam conformal radiation, brachiotherapy, proton beam therapy. I could have told you, my doctor at one time said, I really don't need to do my research anymore as long as you're my patient. <laughs> and after five second opinions, I decided that I wanted the best possible chance to survive this cancer. So on January 14th, 1994, I had, so they told me later, a radical retropubic nerve sparing prostatectomy. And when I woke up, the doctor said, by the way, I found a small hernia while I was in there. I fixed that for you too, no charge. <laughs> so I am so proud to be able to stand before you today and say that for a number of reasons, my legacy, people like you who care about fighting this disease, support from friends and family, from my wife, Jane, who's up in the audience today, I'm a 19-year prostate cancer survivor. And I just want to leave you with this. You guys are the greatest. I would hang with you anytime. This is uh, a time for us this morning to celebrate. This evening, we'll take more time to remember, and of course, tomorrow morning, fighting back against this terrible disease. Don't ever doubt that every step you take on this track today makes a difference. Every dollar you raise today makes a difference. And thanks to you, Calaveras, you make a big difference. Thank you. Catherine Sun. And he's the uh, beautiful physical and visible legacy uh, that she leads. Thank you for being here with me. Those of us here are ever mindful of the triumphs and tragedies represented by those we honor and memorialize today. We should never forget that while we enjoy our daily pleasures and the company of family and friends, there are others who have endured and are presently enduring the misery, deprivation, and discomfort of the diagnosis and treatment of cancer. We call your attention to the small table that occupies a place of dignity and honor. It is set for one, symbolizing the fact that some of our loved ones are missing from this gathering. They have been diagnosed with cancer and they are some of the names and faces behind the luminaria. The chair is empty. Many of those who fought the battle with cancer are no longer with us. But rather than mourning their loss, we choose to celebrate their life. These people are unable to be with their loved ones and families now. So let us join together to recognize and honor them and to bear witness to their struggle and their memory. The table is small, symbolizing the frailty of a single patient, sometimes alone in the fight against his or her disease. The tablecloth is white, symbolic of the medical profession, doctors, nurses, and researchers who help fight the battle for life. Single rose in the vase signifies the enduring love of their families and friends and the strength of the patient's will to fight the disease that ultimately claimed many of them. 
The pink ribbon of, on the vase represents the ribbons worn on the lapels of millions who support a continued search for a cure, not only for breast cancer, but for other cancers as well. Cancers that are expected to kill over half a million people in the United States this year. A slice of lemon on the plate reminds us of the bitter battle against a deadly disease, a battle bought by more than 1.3 million new patients each year. The salt sprinkled on the plate reminds us of the countless tears of personal anguish shed by the patient and those shed by family members and friends who have lost a loved one. The glass is inverted in memory of those people who are not here to join our celebration of successes. But the candle represents the light of hope that lives in the hearts of all of us. Hope represented by cancer survivors and the hope for a cure discovered as a result of the detailed work of the medical profession made able through funds generated through events such as the Relay for Life. The following poem is now offered in memory of Catherine and all our departed loved ones. At the end of the poem, you are invited to make your way to the table and reflect on what it means. And to place a flower in one of the vases in memory of your loved one. We ask that you take a few moments remembering from personal experience a friend, family member, or colleague who is not with us today. Cry not for me, for I am home, at rest, at peace, yet I still roam in drifting shadows and gentle winds. Look to your heart, I dwell within. Cry not for me, don't wail or weep, it's here I live, I do not sleep. Just think of me, and I am there, your joy and sadness I still share. My spirit holds you as you sleep, your heart my home, my castle keep. Each day you live, I walk with you, our bond unbroken, our friendship too. Know that though you cannot see, I'm there with you, for I'm set free. I come and go upon a prayer, and no matter what, I will be there. In the quiet times, as Eve has set, when you're sick or scared or lonely yet, talk with me and listen close. I'll be with you when needed most. Trust your heart and know I'm there, for my spirit sits in that empty chair. So worry not for where I've gone. I'm still here with you as you carry on.